Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining, uh, joining us. My name is Donna Cyrus. I'm a senior attorney uh, in the Office of Governmental Affairs in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau here at FTC. The Office of Intergovernmental Affairs serves as a liaison between the FCC and state and local governments. If you have any questions about our upcoming presentation or anything else regarding the FCC, you can reach us at iga at fcc.gov. Now I'm going to turn things over to Chris Anderson. Chris is the Chief of our Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau's Operations and Emergency Management Division. Thank you, Donna, and thank you for uh, tuning in, or I guess clicking in for today's webinar topic on disaster preparedness. Uh, just as a quick side note, this is a re-recording of a webinar we originally streamed live back in September of 2018. I'm going to start out at the at the risk of being a little paternalistic, starting out with a plug for personal readiness. Um, this is something as I talk to different audiences about incident response, I always include this plug, but I really do think it's particularly important for today's audience because for state, local, territorial, and tribal response officials, uh, the reality is your key responders and their families are quite likely to be victims of whatever the incident is that you're responding to. So it's really critical that they've worked ahead, that those key officials and their families have worked ahead. They know their plan. Their, their family knows how to get out and get safe. They know how they're going to communicate with each other, et cetera. There are lots of great uh, of things available online to help you make those plans. Ready.gov is, is FEMA's version of that, and of course there are, there are all kinds of other um, assets and resources available. Uh, you just got to make yourself take advantage of them. So with that plug complete, um, I'm going to jump into really the, the meat of today's discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll start that out by um, reiterating one of, the, one of the truisms of incident response, which is that all incidents start as local incidents. So today's uh, briefing is not really meant to teach you about what you already do. We fully understand um, at the FCC and across the federal level that when it comes to incident response, it's where the rubber meets the road is with those local leaders, and as incidents get bigger and more overwhelming, cascading upward to state support and then finally into federal support. So what we're going to cover today is really how that state, local, territorial, and tribal response effort plugs into the broader federal effort so that we can work seamlessly together, and then specifically what the FCC does within that structure. So at the federal level, there are sort of three areas where we focus our response. Uh, FEMA runs the, the National Response Coordination Center here in Washington, D.C., other federal departments and agencies will, will work out of the National Response Coordination Center at a sort of a, a very D.C.-centric way. FEMA also has 10 different regions, has the United States and its, its territories broken up into 10 different regions, and each of those regions has a regional response coordination center. And then FEMA will interact most directly with uh, SLTT response officials at a local level, either by plugging into a state emergency operations center or establishing a joint field office where that direct coordination happens. Within FEMA's structure, it organizes and activates what we call emergency support functions. Fifteen uh, ESFs, we'll use the acronym, um, cover sort of task-based um, mission-based breakdowns of the different things that happen during response. The one that we're going to talk about mostly today is emergency support function two, which focuses on communications, both from a tactical, how are public safety officials and government leaders able to talk to each other, and also commercial, how are the commercial communications infrastructures responding to the disaster. As you can see from the slide on the, on the chart, the other ESFs cover things like transportation for ESF-1, ESF-12, energy, search and rescue, ESF-9, and, and so forth. Having set up into that ESF structure provides a great way for that task-based work to happen, but then 
because that ESF structure is echoed at the national level, at the regional level, at the local level, that's the mechanism by which you can do sort of cross-sector coordination. So when there are energy issues affecting communications, that's an ESF2 to ESF12 conversation, and kind of everybody who plays that game understands who's who in the zoo, which is probably a good segue into the last thing on this slide to talk about, which is the National Incident Management System. One of the things we try to do in incident response as much as possible is use a structured, repeated system so that terminology means the same thing, whether it's a, a town official who is setting up an operations section chief at a local incident, all the way up to a FEMA structure with an operations section chief who should be looking at the same sorts of things. Moving into the FCC's activities with respect to incidents, um, the work begins well before any incident happens. So here we're going to talk about um, some of the things that we do blue sky day in, day out within the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and several of the other bureaus and offices within the commission in order to set the stage so that when an incident happens, things are ready to go and things will work as we expect. So the, the first of these is public alerting and looking at the Emergency Alert Service, or EAS, and Wireless Emergency Alerts, WIA. I won't go into them a whole lot here because I have a couple of slides where I'm going to go into more detail on them later, but certainly that's one of the fundamental things that we do here to enable uh, alerts and warnings to get to the public during times of crisis. Public safety licensing. Again, within my bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, we handle all of the licensing for state, local, territorial, and tribal governments across the board, including your public safety officials. So ensuring that your police, fire, EMS, all of those folks have sufficient frequencies that are deconflicted with neighboring jurisdictions so that people can talk uh, seamlessly across the RF spectrum. We also handle uh, the communications sector regulations for how communications providers support public safety answering points and the 911 system, 911, E911, next generation 911, and so forth. We do also do a lot to encourage greater resiliency initiatives across the communication sector. I'm going to talk in a little more detail about some of those in a few minutes, but really looking at two flavors of resiliency, if you will, looking at how can communication assets and systems make themselves harder to bring down so that they never go down at all, but resiliency also means where damage does happen, where, where inevitable um, outages occur, how quickly can those be restored, how um, much can those be contained so that the impact of those are minimized in terms of geography, number of people affected, and time. And then the last piece uh, of the blue sky work that we do is planning to be ready to respond. So certainly within my division, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to FEMA, talking to other partners in the federal government, reaching out through webinars such as this to make sure that the, uh, the people that we need to talk to, the people that we need to coordinate, we're all on the same sheet of music. We will regularly bring the major communication providers into the commission here and hear from them what their emergency response preparations are, the kind of things that they've put in place, the kind of concerns that they may have that we may be able to help with. With. And then finally, we also manage uh, through our Bureau a continuity of operations and continuity of government program to ensure that even if Washington, D.C. is the area that is experiencing the incident, that the Federal Communications Commission can continue to do its mission essential functions, its critical activities, regardless of the status of the government. Um, now moving into sort of actual incident response. I'm going to talk about it from an FCC perspective, um, from a headquarters um, point of view, as well as from a field point of view. So starting with the things that we do here at headquarters in Washington, D.C., 
probably the primary thing uh, that we do is we run the Disaster Information Reporting System, which is called DERS. I'm going to go into, again, this is another one I'm going to go into a little more detail on DERS in a few minutes, so I'm not going to go uh, crazy detailed into that. But essentially, this is the system by which during uh, significant incidents, communication sector companies report to us the status of their systems and networks so that we can analyze that information and share it as appropriate with other response partners. We'll issue special temporary authorities and waivers of our rules. Very often in the response to an incident, um, carriers or our licensees need to do things that are different from how they would normally operate that may be different from the constraints that are placed upon their, their existing licensing, and they need to come to us to make sure that they're able to operate um, legally and without undue interference on, on other users. One of the places this becomes really important from an SLTT perspective is I had mentioned earlier that we do public safety licensing. Well, when we do through mutual assistance programs, you know, that high water search and rescue team comes from Vermont down to Florida during the hurricane, well, they're going to be bringing with them their radios. They're going to expect to be able to talk and communicate, and we need to make sure that the frequencies they're licensed for in their home area are still available in their new deployed area, and they won't be stepping on top of someone. If we wind up where multiple people are needing to use the same frequency, will work through that deconfliction to make sure that people are able to, to talk as they need to. We also at the headquarters level do a range of coordination and information sharing. Our primary partner at the federal level um, is the Department of Homeland Security and a couple of different pieces within DHS. Certainly FEMA as the overall coordinator of federal incident management um, is a key partner but also the National Coordinating Center for Telecommunications over at uh, DHS. Uh, the NCC, as we call it, manages day-to-day -day relationships with major communication providers. They're co-located in some cases. We have regular everyday or once-a-week coordination calls, so we sort of all know each other at the national level, and it makes it very easy when the incident happens to be able to super quick, grab somebody from company A or company B because we talk to them regularly. We'll also do coordination and outreach with public safety answering points, and where we can, we'll try to reach directly to state 911 administrators. One of the things we try to be aware of and, and respectful of at the national level is during a major incident, your individual PSAPs are busy. They're taking calls from the public. They're handling their own incidents. They're, they have things to do. We certainly want to ensure that they're not experiencing any communication problems, and so we really do want to verify comms are good, comms are up, where there are issues, anything that we can do to help. But what we like to do is to do that through an intermediary. And in certain states, for example, just this year uh, with Hurricane Florence in North Carolina, their state 911 administrator was taking a very active role reaching out to each individual PSAP statewide every day. And so rather than us calling those PSAPs and, and putting a burden on them, we were able to just coordinate directly with the 911 administrator. We also reach out through national and regional associations of the different sort of segments of the communications industry, whether that's state broadcast associations or, or national associations. And we coordinate with NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, who handles all of the frequency allocation for federal users. Because again, when there's a big incident and lots and lots of people are coming in from far away, making sure that all of those uh, new responders in an area can talk to each other is really critical. At the field level, the FCC's activities are, are a little bit different. So we, um, we deploy into the field in a couple of different ways. Um, depending on the nature of a specific incident, requests from state and local response officials and our coordination with FEMA. Um, I should probably preface this, we do already maintain a number of field offices through our enforcement bureau where we have personnel already on scene or already in a region of a given incident. 
but we will additionally augment uh, that staff by bringing them together um, in response to an incident. And the things that we do, there are three main things that we do. First of all, I mentioned emergency support function two, which coordinates the communications response effort. Um, we will provide uh, key personnel, whether they're uh, engineers or emergency response subject matter experts, to help work with ESF2 on damage assessment to both government and commercial communications, frequency coordination, which I've already mentioned quite a bit, and coordinating requests for assistance. Um, request for assistance actually in a lot of ways becomes a key component of coordination from the local level through the state to the federal level as we look at individual communications entities, whether it's a cellular provider, whether it's a key broadcaster, when they have needs in order to be able to get their systems back online, they may very well come to you as local response officials and ask for help getting access to their sites if they need either police escort or debris clearance. They may need fuel to run their generators. They, meet, they may need a generator or generator repairs if they don't already have one. So those requests for assistance really come up. They need to be supported at the local level. The state needs to provide its perspective on what of those requests are the most critical to meet and then at the federal level where we may have some of the assets and resources that can meet those, we need to hear that presentation from the state in order to be able to do that. So working with the ESF2 staff, coordinating with um, communication providers and response officials on the ground is really a key component of that field operations. We also, depending on the nature of the disaster, will deploy radio frequency response teams. So these are groups um, typically two-person teams that will go out with an antenna, receiver, spectrum analyzer, and they'll be able to pull in the radio frequency spectrum and see who's operating where, which lets us get a, a direct measured sense of what broadcasters might be up or might be down and an understanding of the public safety spectrum, whether certain frequencies are being clobbered and overused or whether uh, public safety entities who we would expect to be broadcasting or transmitting on their assigned frequencies are silent. That may be a cause for concern. We also uh, augment that radio frequency uh, mission uh, remotely in a couple of different ways. We maintain a nationwide high frequency direction finding network um, due to the nature of high frequency uh, radiation, it tends to travel very, very long distances, and so in order to uh, identify and combat interference at the HF level, we maintain this ability to locate and pinpoint high-frequency um, transmissions anywhere in the U.S. That same network has a pretty good, not a universal, unfortunately, but a pretty good ability to pull in AM radio transmissions, sometimes from a very great distance which will let us in real time or near real time be able to ascertain whether AM broadcasters, for example, are still online and able to provide public information right at landfall or right after landfall from a hurricane. And for us to be able to do that without putting a, a crew in harm's way. Finally, in some parts of the U.S., in partnership with other federal departments and agencies, we may have access to remote capable um, antennas, receivers, and spectrum analyzers that will allow us to essentially reach across the internet or various networks and be able to pull in RF spectrum and analyze it on the spot. Um, that can be very dependent on the geography of the incident and exactly where we may or may not have established um, shared remote equipment. Um, another key component of what we do in the incident management range, and this can happen either at headquarters or uh, down in the field, and it can happen blue sky all the way up through, um, through the actual disaster and the recovery itself. So we talk to industry regularly about preparedness, both what we're doing and what we plan and our capabilities during disaster, as well as hearing from them um, what they're doing to establish their own um, industry level or corporate emergency operation centers 
the things that they do to pre-stage fuel, parts, personnel in advance of a disaster. For example, the major nationwide carriers generally all have very well-funded disaster management programs with trucks full of equipment that are staged strategically around the country and able to deploy those assets as needed. Generally what they'll do is they'll, particularly for a hurricane, which is in some ways the easiest disaster to prepare and respond for because you typically have at least 24 and often you know, 72, 96 hours of advance notice. So they'll start moving those assets close to but not in the danger zone so that as soon as the, the hurricane comes ashore, they're able to, to flow assets in. And they're flowing in assets anywhere from a central office on, on a truck to deployable cellular sites, cell on wheels, sometimes called a cow, or a cell on a light truck, sometimes called a colt, to be able to reestablish cellular communications rapidly after a disaster. Some of the activities that the major carriers will undertake um, are guided by the Wireless Resiliency Cooperative Framework. Um, the Wireless Resiliency Cooperative Framework was a voluntary commitment that the major nationwide carriers and some additional partners have subsequently signed on to do a number of things either in preparation for or <coughs> excuse me, or in response to disasters. So a couple of the things that the framework discusses are circumstances under which carriers will allow customers from other com com competitor carriers to roam onto their network during disaster. For example, back in 2017 during Hurricane Maria, there was fairly widespread cellular roaming such that, generally speaking, if you were if you were a cell customer and you could get a cellular signal, it almost didn't matter what carrier's tower you were connected to, you would be allowed to uh, connect through and make a call. They also look at ways that they can offer each other mutual aid. So being able to, um, again, say during Maria, lots of stories of, you know, company A climbing a tower to reestablish their antenna structure and realizing hey, this is a shared use tower that also has assets from our competitor company. I can see their cable is damaged. I'll just go ahead and replace that while I've got a crew here. So working through those mutual aid things. Working with um, state, local, territorial, and tribal response officials in order to enhance communication preparedness, support to public safety answering points and emergency operation centers doing consumer awareness and consumer preparedness, and agreeing to share more of their information during disasters than they ever have before. The last thing, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but in coordination with industry, the, the typical requests we see over and over again, regardless of disaster type almost, are the things that industry is going to need to get back on its feet are stable sources of power, whether that's commercial power restoration to their key facilities or a steady supply of liquid fuel to be able to keep generators up and running. They need to be able to access their facilities. And sometimes this is, this is a key component of local coordination because your local public safety officials are, with good reason, trying to keep people out of the disaster area. We don't need more victims. We don't need you know, looters coming in, they're very cognizant of who comes in and out of the disaster area. It's really critical to get those communication providers to be able to come in and access their site. So we get a lot of requests for those kind of access issues, as well as security. So um, making sure post-disaster, you know, a, a highly capable generator that's, that's solid and strong enough to power a cell site um, is a pretty valuable commodity, and making sure that the, the kinds of portable assets that they're bringing in um, are able to be kept safe from, um, safe from theft. Now, I had briefly mentioned the disaster information reporting system earlier, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of what it is and what it does. So uh, during normal steady state operations, the FCC operates a related but distinct system called NORS, or the Network Outage Reporting System. 
NORS has a mandatory component primarily for providers of voice communications, either wired or wireless voice, that they have to notify us under certain parameters when, uh, when their service goes down because of, uh, because of equipment malfunction. So NORS is sort of the normal steady state way that we keep tabs on general resilience of communication networks. But it doesn't provide enough granular information to be helpful or to be as helpful as it might be during disasters. That's where DERS comes in. So when a major disaster happens, we'll work with our partners at Department of Homeland Security, figure out where we need additional information and we'll activate DERS for a limited time and a limited geographic area. What we'll do for carriers is we will waive their obligations to report to us in NORS, our normal system, as long as they're providing information into us in DERS. And DERS allows us to track to a very um, close degree the communications restoration and the restoration over time of uh, damaged assets from a disaster. So in DERS, we'll get information on cable customers, status of public safety answering points, pieces of major equipment that are critical for communications networks, wireline and wireless customers out of service, how many cell sites are up and down, radio and TV stations that are up or are down. The companies uh, are able to provide us this information through an online interface that lets us capture all of that information in a database and more easily track and analyze the data. Once we get those reports in, which typically we have reports in um, by mid-morning from the communication providers, we take a couple of hours to sift through that information and we'll generate a series of reports, some public reports that we'll post on the FCC website that will contain aggregated data across the disaster area and then some more detailed reports that may contain more sensitive or company, company, company proprietary information that we'll share as necessary with DHS and FEMA. Um, the benefits to providers in this, certainly there's a clear benefit to us and to response partners having this additional information, but it benefits the providers because they're able to designate contacts so that we're reaching to the right people when we have questions they're able to use DERS to report um, needs that they may have for help or assistance. It streamlines the inquiries that they're dealing with, um, and it allows them to aid their, the communities where they um, live and operate. I also wanted to go into a little bit more detail about alerting and alerting in general. Um, two different flavors of alerting that I'm going to discuss, emergency alert system for EAS and wireless emergency alerts. Um, so EAS is broadcast focused, think radio and TV, um, and WIA or wireless emergency alerts are the alerts you get on your cellular devices. Before I go into this section, I, I want to kind of make a slight detour um, and distinguish these two things. They're a key component, but they're not the sum total of uh, the broader uh, concept of alerting, the ways that we get public messaging to people who need it in times of disaster. So from a state, local, territorial, and tribal perspective, understanding how EAS and WIA fit into your overall public messaging strategy is important, but that strategy also needs to include thinking through how your elected leaders and public safety officials will be able to get official guidance out through broadcast through their websites, through social media, however they're going to do that, how you're able to provide information to news gathering and news reporting organizations, and whether or not your jurisdiction um, elects to use third-party alerting applications that uh, may have an opt-in component uh, for your citizens. In terms of alerting on the EAS side, so again, this is the, the TV and radio, so it covers not just sort of traditional broadcast TV and radio, but also cable operators, satellite radio, uh, internet protocol TV service providers. Um, what EAS requires is that all participants must deliver the highest level of alerts, the overall presidential alerts. The kind of history of this system goes all the way back into the early days of the Cold War 
as a mechanism for the president to be able to, to reach out um, in the event of a nationwide emergency or, or heaven forbid, a, uh, a nuclear attack. So that presidential alert is a mandatory requirement. Delivery of all other alerts, weather alerts, state and local officials alerts, amber alerts, gray alerts, those are all voluntary, though we have pretty good participation. And I think a tremendous number of these TV and radio providers are, um, you know, they really view themselves as critical components to overall community resilience. EAS alerts are distributed in, in two completely separate ways, and it's done this way to provide resilience and redundancy so that even if some stations are out, even if there's damage to some components of the system, that alerts will still be able to go out. So the first way is an Internet-based protocol called IPAWS, the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Um, this is a web-based feature. Uh, EAS equipment will monitor uh, FEMA's feed, if you will, of IPAWS alerts, make a determination, oh, this is an alert that's appropriate to my uh, broadcast or my viewership area. They'll pick up that alert and pass it through their system. There's also a broadcast-based distribution architecture. Each state um, or territory should have its own established emergency alert system plan, their state EAS plan, which will designate specific stations that maintain a primary role so that there will be a primary entry point in each state or territory where they have redundant ways to, to get initial alerts. And then other broadcast stations within your state have a, will um, monitor that primary ent entry point and then as, at another level down, you know, states in all of your localities will then be monitoring one of those local primaries that monitors the primary entry point so that there's a cascading ability. Hey, I hear that station down the road is broadcasting alert. I'm going to pick that alert up and broadcast it too. So that's also the plug for state EAS plans, making sure that, uh, that state response officials are in good coordination with your broadcast associations and your key broadcasters, and those, those plans make sense, they're understood, everybody knows their role, and they provide good coverage across your jurisdiction. On the um, wireless emergency alert side, so these are the um, alerts that come in over your cell phone. Uh, provision of these alerts are completely voluntary by wireless providers. Um, however, if providers elect to participate, then they have to follow rules that the FCC has established about how those alerts need to work. The alerts overall use cellular broadcast technology to get alerts out. They monitor that IPAWS feed that I mentioned earlier, the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System architecture. And they come in sort of three different flavors, that presidential alert that I discussed earlier, imminent threat, and AMBER or mission, mission death, missing children alerts. Um, we have recently undertaken a, a number of efforts to strengthen WIA, including um, a, a much more capable version of geotargeting so that alerts can go to a more finite area. Therefore, you're getting alerts to the people who actually need to take action, um, which is an important component of any alerting system. As we're drawing towards the close, I wanted to point back at some of the things that we learned from 2017, and, uh, and some of these were, were borne out to one degree or another in 2018, looking at our, our major response. I've already mentioned the three critical items that uh, communication providers are always going to be looking for post-disaster, fuel, access, and security. We really saw the importance of pre-disaster relationships. Um, certainly for this audience, those government to industry relationships, you should know at whatever your level of planning is, whether you know it's a local mayor or a county official or a state official, <coughs> excuse me, you should know the key industry players in your state. You should um, not be exchanging business cards or trying to find somebody's phone number after the earthquake has happened or the, or the hurricanes come ashore. We observed that 
um, again, depending on the nature of a specific disaster, that in general, resilience investments paid off. Um, the survivability of trenched uh, fiber optic cable versus aerial fiber optic cable on poles. Um, the importance of having not just having a generator for critical operations, but making sure it's well maintained, has spare parts available, and a secure access uh, to sufficient fuel to keep operations going. Looking at making sure that physical plant, particularly in risk areas, are built to the standards that are designed for that risk area. Whether you're building facilities in a hurricane prone area and paying attention to what the high wind standards are, or in a earthquake prone area and building to those standards. Also looking at where it's feasible to ensure that there's path redundancy. And what I mean by that is to make sure, hey, that public safety answering point, that broadcast tower, how many different ways can I get content where it needs to be um, that are independent of one another so that if I lose my fiber connection, I have a microwave backhaul, et cetera. And uh, finally, the, the clear cross-reliance between energy and communications. Not simply that communications needs uh, access to either commercial or reliable generator power in order to operate, certainly true, but it really goes beyond that. The energy companies need to be able to communicate amongst themselves and within their operations in order to fully function. The number of shared conduits, shared pole infrastructure, shared trenches, really there's a, there's a overlap between the resilience and the recovery of energy and communications. We have available our, uh, our lessons learned or our observation report is available at the FCC webpage and we've got the link up on the screen. So um, I think this is my, almost my final slide, my penultimate slide is, uh, so what are we doing now? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a bit of a rebroadcast of something we did back in September and so we've added a new, uh, a new step in the 2017 AAR, which is to look at 2018, we had some more fair, very significant events, uh, Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Michael, um, a number of near, near misses or tropical storm hits in Hawaii, certainly the wildfires in California. So there's a lot to look at from 2018 to, uh, to see what we can learn from that, and, and we're certainly um, engaging on that now. In terms of taking our 2017 after action forward, we have looked at a number of ways that we can enhance the disaster information reporting system, the wireless resiliency cooperative framework. We're looking at better ways that we can use uh, radio frequency survey and over the air data collection in ways that can more rapidly and comprehensively inform the response effort increasing our engagement with emergency management partners, for example, by doing things like this webinar, reaching out to, to those of you in the state, local, territorial, and tribal government sphere to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music with respect to disaster response, and looking at ensuring that there's efficient communications um, for those underserved populations in non-English languages. Um, I'll also add here for a bit we, um, we have undertaken a number of uh, actions in partnership with, uh, with industry and with state and local governments, um, not the least of which is working through the FCC's Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, where we are uh, working explicitly and have asked the committee to help us work through or to give us some recommendations on best practices or actions that we can do to uh, improve or, again, sort of codify, establish best practices for public communication, how EAS and WIA combine with other public messaging to ensure that emergency information gets out um, rapidly and to who needs it. A big part of that is ensuring that that information gets out to some traditionally underserved communities or communities that have communication challenges, including non-English speakers, the deaf community, the hard of hearing community, the blind community, and so forth, making sure that all of those components of, of our communities get the information they need. 
um, what we can do to establish best practices or to, or to help in the coordination with industry for those things like access, fuel, security that I've talked about a couple times. Working through how from the local government to the regional to the state or territorial government, how the states establish, evaluate, and communicate their priorities to the federal government, particularly with respect to what communication assets um, are high priority is really important. Um, again, we'll, from a FEMA perspective, they may have a limited ability to um, prioritize access to fuel or help repair a generator or to <coughs> provide debris clearance so that someone can access their facility, but we really need to hear from the state that this is a priority, and so it's important that you think through those things and understand how you're able to communicate up the, the incident response chain, if you will, to say, hey, this is the only radio tower in our county until this is brought back up. We don't have an ability to reach out to our populations. It's important to be able to a, identify that in advance, and B, be able to communicate that so that response assets can be uh, distributed accordingly. And then finally, we've asked uh, the committee to give us some, uh, some of their perspectives on how we can better establish the resilience of public safety communications sort of across the spectrum. People tend to gravitate towards the, you know, the PSAPs, the 911 call centers themselves, but how do the calls get there? Once the calls are there, does that PSAP have an ability to reach out to police, fire, EMS, actually dispatch equipment? Is it computer-aided dispatch? Is it radio dispatch? Is it landline dispatch? How does that component work? And thinking through the resilience of those systems um, from beginning to end. Finally, as a direct result of the 2018 hurricane season, I'll just mention that the chairman has um, called on my bureau to begin an investigation into uh, the service restoration, the issues surrounding service restoration in the hardest hit areas of Florida. So that's a specific piece of work that we have um, kicked off now. We have a public notice that's currently out with comments, um, accepting comments through mid-December. So we will begin to do that investigation and as uh, we learn different things, whether from that investigation, from our continued coordination with carriers, from what we're hearing from the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee or our other advisory committees, we will continue to engage with you all in the state, local, territorial, and tribal uh, communities to ensure that we're all working together as best we can to uh, promote and work towards greater communication systems resilience. So um, with on my final slide, I'm just going to offer you some key points of contact, um, places you can reach out to for information. Obviously, uh, this is a, a seminar sponsored by our uh, Intergovernmental Affairs Office, and they are uh, and will continue to be a key point of contact for you. They'll be able to, to get to whatever subject matter experts you need within the commission. During disasters themselves, we maintain within the Commission a 24-7, uh, 365 operation center capability. You have their contact information here. And I will also offer the Department of Homeland Security National Coordinating Center for Communications. The NCC also runs a 24-7 op center, um, and they are very well coordinated at the national level with major communication providers, the carriers, and so forth. So you may want to jot these down or note these so that when, uh, when the balloon goes up, you, you know who to reach out and talk to. And so with that, uh, I was talking pretty fast, trying to get a lot of information across. I appreciate the opportunity to um, spend this time with you. Uh, those of you who have made it all the way through the webinar, I appreciate your attention. And I'm going to turn it back over to Donna for a closeout. Thanks, Chris. That was very informative and timely. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we part? Um, no. I, I, well, I guess I would say, you know, the, the ongoing efforts that we have in terms of how can we make things better, you know, we certainly want to hear from you. I mentioned um, the, the specific committees that we've asked that are specifically looking at some of these. 
but certainly um, I, I mentioned earlier in the slide as well the establishment of relationships. You know, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have good ideas, we're certainly um, open to hear those and uh, look forward to ever improving our relationships with, uh, with state, local, territorial, and tribal officials and being more effective in our incident response. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this important presentation. Once again, if you have any questions, you can contact us at iga at FCC.gov. Additionally, feel free to share any ideas, ideas you may have for future webinar topics. Until next time, thanks again for joining us.